I'm here to introduce my first guest uh, on my trip to beautiful, beautiful Traverse City, Michigan. Those of you from Michigan, when you say Traverse City, you know people from out of state. If you ever get a chance to visit, it is just a beautiful place. The first person I'm going to introduce is an equally beautiful person. His name is Dave Ginsberg known to most basketball people as Gins. He was the Gins. I knew him when he was a longtime assistant at Central Michigan University, and he worked for what well, was one of my best friends until we sadly lost him like a year ago, Dick Parfit. Dick Parfit was the head coach at Central. Dave Ginsburg was the assistant, and Dave Ginsburg was a great recruiter for Coach Parfit. He also coached at nine high schools around the state of Michigan. So he's been at the levels of high school and college and um, was really active in coaching like semi-pro teams. And if you just were in a gym during my era, it wasn't unusual to see Dave Ginsburg in the same gym. Um, he also, as far as I always say, the small orange ball brings people together. He also coached against my wife and against my daughter at two different schools. And um, so I've had a history with Coach Ginsburg. He's in the uh, BCAM, Basketball Coaches Association, Michigan Hall of Fame. He was the first director of the Michigan High School Basketball Coaches Association nationally and is now in their Hall of Honor. So he has a lot of awards. He was just inducted into the Jewish Hall of Fame in Michigan. Well, one time when Coach Gins was at Central, they had four NBA players on the team at Central Michigan University, and they lost in, I believe, the quarterfinals to Kentucky, and they had a great player we might remember named Goose Givens. But anyway, he had a great effect on the state of Michigan, at Central Michigan, and the young people that he coached. And I think you'll see by the interview that's going to follow what a great basketball person, but I emphasize person, Dave Ginsburg is. So I'm here with Dave Ginsburg. Dave is a legendary coach that we talked about in the introduction. Dave, just kind of tell them a few things you want them most likely to know other than your highlights about your involvement in basketball. Well, my highlights was that I survived coaching and stuck with it for 40 seasons, which is something I'm most proud of. I had great mentors when I was a young guy. I was stubborn. I, was, I had misconceptions about what coaching was and what was success and what wasn't success, like most young coaches. And I had some really good mentors. Oh, geez, Ted Cole, he, Dick Parfit, Charlie Coles, even a guy named Dick Bennett, who used to be at Wisconsin, Milwaukee, spent time with me and way back in Battle Creek, Grand Rapids, Flint. I just had people that held my feet to the fire and kept my motivation going. And I just hung in there and had 40 seasons. And now that I look back at it, my biggest, um, the thing I'm most proud of is that I think I did a good job with most of the people I worked with. You're not going to get to everybody. You're not going to do the right things with every player or young person you come in contact with. But I think for the most part, I did a good job. So that's that's in a nutshell how I well, feel. Well, you're in a number of Hall of Fames. I, I read them <laughs> off on the intro, but give all the Hall of Fames you're in real well, quick. Well, I mean, I may... I was uh, coach of the year in some conferences around Flint, the Saginaw Valley, the Big Nine. Up here in Traverse City, I was in, I, w I made coach of the year in a couple of conferences, which is not that important. Uh, what it means is that you your team was successful. You know, if you, if your team's successful, then everybody gets a piece of the success. But I'm in the Basketball Coaches Association and Michigan Hall of Fame and the National High School Basketball. Coaches Association Hall Hall of Honor. So, uh, and you I, just got inducted to one. 
Uh, well, time, when you get old, Bob, time goes quickly. So it wasn't that, maybe uh, 16, 18, I don't know. Oh, I was inducted into the Michigan Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, that yeah. happened this less than a year ago. I thought it wasn't that and long ago. And I really didn't know that much about it until I looked it up and uh, discovered that the guy used to own the Pistons is in there. Uh, he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Brown, who coached the Pistons, is in there. Uh, the the great who's the great baseball player with the Tiger Tigers. He was their initial, and, and way back, uh, it was the Tigers uh, um, All Star. So there's a lot of uh, wonderful people that uh, are in that Hall of Fame, and I'm I'm just I'm honored to be uh, in my little acceptance speech I just said you know I'm the first person in my family that was born in America and when I was a child all the adults of my life were, were looking over their shoulder because of the Holocaust you know they were very nervous people my parents were always look and I kind of took that and ran with it I mean I didn't I, I wasn't afraid of a lot of things when I coached I, I made some mistakes but I wasn't fearful because I had seen them kind of fight their way through that bad time in history. And so that's who I am. I am a product of my background. And, and we knew each other. I, I, I thought about on the way up the things like I knew you because I was a good friend with Dick Parfit. Right. And I followed Central. And then how it's funny how the little orange ball kind of makes turns. Yeah. You coached against my wife. I don't know if you remember sure, that. Sure, Flint Central girls. Yeah, you were coaching at Flint Central, and my wife, when we first moved to Midland, and I was coaching at Northwood, she coached the girls at Northwood, yeah. at uh, Midland. So I looked down the end of the bench, and there's Coach Ginsburg. Yeah. And then we came up here for a tournament. Oh, I think my daughter Ellie was a freshman. She graduated, so eight, nine, ten years ago. And we're playing. Traverse City West, where we are now at this right. beautiful school, and Ellie was playing against you there. So you coached against yeah. my wife, you coached against my daughter, yeah. and sometimes I say the, the little orange ball can make the world a pretty yeah. small Well, place, if you're you stubborn know? enough to stick with it, you're going to cross a lot of paths. When I think of the different gyms I've coached in, in, in the l different leagues that I co I bet I've coached in a lot of gyms over 40 years. I mean... I mean, little gyms, big gyms, small gyms. The Davison gym we played Saginaw on a regional final, 4,000 people. So it's funny, I coached girls six years out of 40, and two of those years we crossed paths because your wife being in Midland and your daughter, uh, outstanding player at Dow, and I was coaching here. So, yeah, yeah, the, the ball will take you in a lot of places. And it makes for good friends and That's right. good situations. And well, you were friends with Dick Parfit. He, was, he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime, bringing me back to Central and allowing me to be on his staff, which introduced me to a whole lo different level of uh, basketball. You know, mm -hmm. Division One recruiting, coaching guys that are just great players. Uh, that's a... I can't, I'm so glad I talked to him before he passed away and just told him, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you, thank you, because he, he, he just shot me into a whole nother arena. But yeah, that was your friend and you had a good one. He loved you. I love Parf. We used to play a lot of tennis, tennis. together and we just stayed in touch. And, yeah. uh, but the big purpose of what we're doing um, is we all love the game. And I have a good friend over here, Tom Gazelko, who's going to come after. And we're killing two birds with one stone, come to Traverse City. But when I got out of coaching and I started coaching my daughter's fourth grade team, I started this mission to, okay, I'm unemployed. I'm not coaching now. How am I going to get my kids to college? And well, they, fortunately for me, they all kind of love basketball and we are around it. But I would come home from practice, youth practice, and I would keep telling my wife, this is not going to work. There's no way this is going to work. And, and my experience in the game told me that this couldn't work. And I thought that youth basketball was over-organized. I thought it was too almost stale. Like I used to tell my kids, I, I'm glad I didn't have to learn basketball like this. 
you know, an organized team, with people in the stands, right. people the yelling. Yeah. I learned in my driveway, my mom and dad were rebounding for me, and we used to play with the neighborhood kids. I'm from a little town called Sparta, and we would ride our bikes to Rogers Park, and there were two courts. Older kids were over here, younger kids were over there, and when the older guy was out, they would come down to the younger kids and just kind of yeah. gave us tips. That's it. And then I wrote about um, St. Cecilia, and when I first started coaching college basketball at Lake Superior State, there was a gym in Detroit called St. Cecilia. And I said, I couldn't punt a football and not hit 25 college players. Yeah. And they're out there playing. And there were guys just sitting there watching them and they were wearing their dickies and their jeans and, their, and the guy would go get a drink of water and they'd say, hey young fellow, why don't you work on it? And I, I said, that's the way really kids should learn. They shouldn't learn with an over, drama over drama of how I thought kids were learning so basically we're gonna give you a hat now not the hat you're wearing but a different hat if you were the king of basketball what would you do different than what's going on or what did you see that worked in the past that maybe we're not doing now because I'm in search for the way to make it better for I love the game I love kids I love my own kids and I felt I was able to give them a head start and I want to be able to do that for all the kids. At the end of my life, at the end of my basketball life, I almost envision myself as maybe a Bobby basketball seed. I want to <laughs> plant basketballs all around and yeah. help kids play better. Yeah. And uh, I tell people all the time, I can't give you a shortcut because I don't believe there are a shortcut. No, right. But I can give you a way to avoid the detours and I can get you off the roads that are closed. So what would Dave Ginsburg go into all these parents that, and these youth coaches that are watching our video tell them, like if you're looking at the camera and you're just saying, this is what I would do, give us what you're gonna do. Well, I, I have to back up a little bit and just say that anytime you work with young people, even the real young ones you're talking about, or even young people in high school and college on the best teams, you have to develop relationships. You've got to, they've, you've got to trust them, they've got to trust you. You're not gonna accomplish anything if the, the people you're working with don't buy into who you are as a person. If you don't act like or project that you love the game and you love you love everything about it, then they're, they're, it's not going to go good. I, that's my philosophy. Um, I tell you what, I coached 40 years. The last eight or nine years, it hit me that I had been doing it wrong. And I had some successes, I had some failures during the first three fourths of my career. But it hit me that the game is instinctive. It's fast changing. It's, it's a player has to be able to react to the game and be prepared to have the correct reaction if they're gonna experience success. I used to be so structured. I'm gonna run this offense. I'm gonna run this play. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold my players accountable. I want your foot in this position. I want, and invariably you're playing an opponent and the opponent will do something to mess with all that. Mm -hmm. And then it stops. Then they look at you and say, hey coach, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And if you haven't spent an enormous amount of the time you're with them on all the things that can happen to them when that occurs, you are, you're, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. You know, I coached with some great coaches. At college, I was with Ted Coe. He, he had his strengths at Central Michigan. He was a structured guy, but I got a lot out of that. And then with Dick Parfit, I mean, he was a competitor and he fierce and, and he, he was a structured guy, but he broke away a little. And then with Charlie Coles, Charlie taught me a whole new uh, uh, business with basketball, how instincts, how, how the game was fast changing. So the last eight or nine years of my coaching career, even at the varsity level, these are older kids, I spent almost all my time on teaching fundamentals. How to pass, how to catch, how to get open. If I'm passing to you, this is a two-person responsibility. 
It's my responsibility to get you the ball in the correct position, but it's your responsibility that if you're being closely guarded, get open. How do you get open? How do you step into somebody and pop out and show your hands and and so all those things, you know, then one-on-one, -on -one, you know, teaching one-on-one -on -one moves, showing, teaching one-on-none, showing how to, what, a, what a pivot foot is and, and how to catch the ball with the correct pivot foot down, how to jab step, how to, how to make a short fake, get the person to rise up and take advantage of it. I mean, there's, I'm not going to mention all the, there's so many fundamentals in basketball, but I spent almost all my time teaching all of those things. I, I invented drills. I had drills that no one else had, you know, how to defense a screen, how to chase the guy being screened. Uh, if you're guarding the screener, how to help on the, I mean, all of that. I broke the game down. And if I was teaching, if coaching young people, fourth grade, fifth grade, it wouldn't be as specific in certain parts of the game as that. But dribbling, dribbling waist high, not too high, uh, uh, all the, you know, through your legs, when you do it, why not to do it. There's an old thing about dribbling. A little is good. It's like candy. A little is good, but a lot will make you sick. Mm -hmm. See, I don't like over dribbling. I believe in dribbling to gain an advantage. Advance the ball at the floor, create a passing lane, or get an advantage. Um, so, it, you know, spending an enormous amount on dribbling, on jump stops, on footwork, on how to use either foot as a pivot foot, how to get the ball up appropriately around the basket, you know, regarding shooting. There's so many things, teaching shooting properly, teaching the perimeter shooting, and then shooting closer and near the basket. All of those things. And then I would eventually go one-on-one, two-on-two, three-on-three, and then slowly demonstrate. If I, if, I take, if I take this defender and I get into a space where it's three-on-two, what am I looking for? And what are the other two players supposed to be doing upon penetration? Mm -hmm. and, and teaching them, because I had an offense my last few years. I had a spread offense versus man-to-man -man defense and a structured offense, like an old shuffle, like the wheel. And I ran two different offenses. But invariably what we were running, I told them they had permission to break the offense anytime they wanted. If they thought they could make a basketball play, a play that will lead to a reasonable shot, a power move to the basket where they might get fouled, anytime they wanted to break the play, penetrate, skip a pass, they had the, I gave them permission. Mm -hmm. But then you had to show them what that looked like. You couldn't just say that. You had to show them. And I, I think you can do that with fourth, fifth, sixth graders. I think you can do that. I think you can teach, show them the fundamentals, demonstrate where they fit into the game as a whole, and then, and then, and then have competition. I, competition is the last thing. I, I'd have one-on-one -on -one competition and say you get three dribbles or two dribbles. You, you, you get to the basket or you get a jump shot off. Two dribbles. And, and, you know, and then same thing with defense. Now defense, I was very specific. I, I, I gave them freedom on offense and I was sp specific on defense. I, I didn't play with defense. You couldn't get on the floor if I didn't have faith that you weren't going to do what I asked you to do. You know, the whole team's guarding this ball. The whole team. Mm -hmm. One dribble, everybody's coming. I don't want the highest percentage shot. I don't want layups. I don't want shots in the paint. You're going to shoot a perimeter shot under some duress. And that's how I felt. And that's my philosophy. Every coach has their own philosophy. But you have to be, you have to have trust with your players and you you have to have enough. See, the game is a game of mistakes. You just want to have your team make fewer mistakes than than they would, uh, you know, normally, mm -hmm. or than the opponent. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Does that make sense to you? Sure. And what I did is when I when I got out of coaching at Northwood, we started a basketball club called the Midland Basketball Academy. Right. We had like twenty eight teams, and. Part of the deal, they practiced twice a week, and then we did one week training that I would run a training. Mm -hmm. 
And I was basically starting out like, okay, I'm going to teach them stuff like high school stuff and college stuff and how to, you know, mm -hmm. take that cone on or take that chair on. Mm -hmm. The last 10 minutes, I'd let them scrimmage. And it was my first eureka moment. They couldn't scrimmage. They absolutely could not scrimmage. The movement of the movement, five. They're playing three on three at both ends, or we had three on three at one end, two on two on the other end. They couldn't get open. I said, wait a second. I played on a one car garage. One car garage. We played three on three, and we could all get open. And I thought it was what I call the instinctual field play, and in that kids normally, like when I went up and played, and I don't know how it was with you or Tom. But we played all the time in the driveway in the park, and the coaches thought we were playground hot dogs, and they were going to give us fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. Right. This generation is taught much differently. And if I didn't see it with my kids, I don't think I would have saw it. I think it was Plato. I think it was Plato that said, to teach this generation like we taught the last generation is to rob the mother future. Mm. And so I started seeing these kids couldn't scrimmage. So we started teaching them, instead of 10 minute scrimmage, it was a half hour. Then it went to 45 minutes. Then mm -hmm. it went almost to the whole hour. But we were teaching them habits and how to play, but kind of taking it back to where I learned, like, which I thought was a natural progression on a driveway. I'd make mistakes, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd watch my kids play, and they're playing in this peewee league at the Midland Community Center. There's 150 family members there, and they're yelling at the kids to do something. And yeah. the coaches had clipboards and whistles. And I said, you know what? I'm going to get my kids as far away from these clipboards and whistles yeah. as I Good can move. get. I want them to go out and play with some kind of instinctual play. Then you can kind of hammer it in. But we always played with fundamentals. We always had fundamentals. And then as I got a little better at it, we started teaching them through play by putting the fundamentals in. For example, if the person caught the ball and didn't look at the basket, that was a violation of not having basket area vision. So it's just like a double dribble or a travel. Mm -hmm. If a kid threw a lollipop pass instead of a straight line pass, mm -hmm. that was a lollipop pass. Mm -hmm. If they're standing on the court, we said, look it, you're watching the paint dry. That's a violation, just like a double dribble or travel. So everything that I basically felt I did with my kids or the kids that we worked with, we tried to teach them through play because I think kids weren't playing. Like you could probably tell me, you know, I'm going to interview Marshall Thomas next week. And say, Beautiful. Oh, hi. Oh. But he said he would just take his car, get his lawn chair out there and watch kids play at the park. Mm -hmm. You know, wh where did that go? Mm -hmm. And just because we got into organized teams, I don't know if you ever knew Don Meyer. Oh, yeah, with the legs. With yeah. the he won the Jim Valvano ESPY oh, Award. Oh, he was fantastic. He had 5,000 kids at a summer. And I said, Don, I think if you were coaching today, your camps you'd have to run differently. And this, I mean, he was basically in hospice at this thing. I said, mm -hmm. why do you say that? I said, because kids used to go to camp because they loved it and they wanted to get more. Now kids are going to camp to learn how to play basketball. Yeah, it's a whole different it is mindset. Completely different. So, you know, if we go down that road a little bit, what, like, how many times did you go to the parks in Flint and oh. just see great players? And what well, was great about them? Well, Don Meyer, he said something one time and it stuck with me. You don't get what you emphasize, you get what no. You don't get what you teach, you get what you emphasize. I remember hearing him say that at a clinic at Rochester or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Man, that stuck with me. You know, in other words, you teach something, you gotta go over it and over it and over This is for teams. Mm -hmm. But uh, man, he was a clever guy, smart. You know, in the old days, you'd hang around in a park, maybe f for an hour, maybe longer, to get in a game. And then you fought like mad to win because <laughs> Otherwise, you've got to set out. Now, the, I remember being in Flint. I remember being, I, I grew up in Genesee County. Man, going to the north end of Flint and seeing these guys that I'd heard about at Flint Central, Flint Northern, and the King Saginaw. And, and, and I finally got in the game. Man, we, we played our hearts out. I mean, we just fought. Um, but you're right. Uh, going to a park and being out there with other players trying to beat you and competing. It teaches you to move, uh, teaches you to have some spacing, you know, pick and roll, which as they see on TV all the time. You have to learn how to defend that. But you're absolutely right. You, you, the, the amount of time spent playing pickup ball 
and not structured ball has dwindled dramatically. You know, I remember Marshall telling me that one time. He'd go somewhere and just sit and watch him play. And I, he, he, I said, that's pretty impressive. He, he, you know, he'd learn his players what they could do, what they couldn't do. And he had great, he was a great high school coach, great. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that's consistent with what I feel. I mean, he, you, you, the game, the love of the game, the commitment of time, the encouraging your your children to go out and play. Uh, I'm in awe of what you accomplished with that Midland group. I mean, I played, coached against your daughter at Midland Dow, I think a couple of times, and uh, she was she was a handful. I remember telling our players about her. She was a handful. I said, "You're gonna have to really guard this girl now. This girl." If you take away her right hand, she's going to go left. If you take her left, you're going. She's going to go right. She's going to compete. She's going to make every open shot. You know, she knew what to do in a variety of situations. So one of the reasons I decided to write the book, is I was another one of my eureka moments. I'm sitting in Petoskey, and I'm debating what snacks. I don't, you know, I'm not in it. And there's this little girl in this JV team camp, and she caught the ball on the right wing, and the coach called the two play. Right? So she got the ball and she dribbled to the sideline. And she picked up her dribble and she didn't know how to pivot so she stood straight up. Sure. And everybody on the court was just yelling but nobody came back to help her get the ball. And what we always told my kids is if you get stuck, dribble to the middle of the court, at least you can go right or left. Right? And if you get caught, you get low and you pivot. pivot. And if your teammate's in trouble, you come back and help them get the ball. And if you are on the sideline, throw it off their leg. Well, the coach called timeout, and you know what the coach had the problem was? She didn't know the two call. You know, and I think that's kind of how we've progressed and so what I'm trying froze. to do. She froze, but to me, as the old man in the gym or an old guy, no, it's more problem that you didn't know go back and help her. Yeah. It's your problem that you drove to the sideline. Yeah. It's a bigger problem you don't know how to pivot, and it's yeah. a bigger problem you don't know need to go to the middle. Yeah. And that's where I feel like we're losing the game and that the kids don't have a basic understanding. Like yeah. a coach, a normal youth coach, maybe has three hours of practice a week. A lot of kids will miss them. So he's got to get organized. He has to put in his offense. He has to put in his own defense. He has to get a press. He has to get a press breaker. They don't really work on playing. Out of bounds plays. You know, out of bounds plays. I, I've said I think more kids have learned 10 out of bounds plays before they've ever played one on one. That's right. And I think old people, like Chuck Daly, um, when Pistons used to practice at Oakland, he got back from Barcelona and he said, you know, Bob, they got a blueprint. They know what they're doing. They got a blueprint to what they're doing in Europe. In Europe, but what's our blueprint? We don't really have a blueprint of they're on this team, they're on that team. They learn that yeah. offense, or they, they bypass that the offense. fundamentals. Yeah, and I even go back to even it's more what you were talking about. If you got to play, make a play. The the instincts and the feel and yeah. the IQ and so what we did a lot was um, we played a lot of no dribble. We just we would play short-sighted games because what I found as a youth coach, I couldn't teach them five on five. I coached for thirty years and I couldn't teach a fifth grader five on five, but I could teach them one on one or two on two or yeah. three on three. So that's basically our whole practice was playing one on one, two on two, three on three. Yeah. With those habits I talked about earlier, you know, violation if you're not in a stance, it was a basket for the other team and. Like if you're the varsity coach at Traverse City West, you want the youth coaches to give you every kid is in a stance every time, or they play in an effective one-three-one zone. Every coach I talk to, well, I want them in a stance. <laughs> so why are we doing it the other way? Yeah. You know, do you want them to throw lollipop passes, or you want them to be able to fake a pass and make a straight line pass? Well, I want them to fake a pass and make a straight line. So there's no really. To me, it's, it's been like there's not as much direction. There's not as much, and I and I believe that. Well, one of the we'll talk about it now. But where did trial and error go? I would go to my kids' games and they would yell at them. So they're not trying to mess up, you know. No. Well, they're going to make a mistake, right? They they got to make a. It's a game of mistakes. Yeah, and so they learn by trial and error. 
you know, one time I said to a parent during one of our trainings, they're yelling at this guy, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I still can't set a VCR. I tried for 10 years. This is back when VCRs. Why do you think this fifth grader is going to get introduced to something, go down and back and get it right? We got to right. allow the kids to make mistakes. You know, I always tell my kids, the kids that make the most mistakes, a lot of times will win because they're trying to do something. Like here's something, and I want you to do most of the talk, and that's why I came up here, but just, if you were going to run a program from a young age, my son is really into tennis. You know, Nadal is 114 and three at the French Open. He's won 14 French Opens. Guess what percentage of points he's won during that period of time? Quite a few. 50, 54%. 54%. 54%. That's the difference. You know what I mean? The difference between winning wow. and losing Thin. is in that play, and you're not going to win them all, but you got to keep trying to win them all. You know, like every time I ask them, oh, I had to win 80% of the points. <laughs> 54%. Wow. You know, and, and the difference is, is just doing it more, better, longer, you know. So basically, let's just say... I'm going to start with this preference, and I'm going to say where you're going to go. Let's say you and I in Traverse City, and we're going to divide up 20, 20 fourth graders, okay? We're allowed the same amount of time. We can't start in an academy where there's 24 hours a day. <coughs> same amount of time, and when they're 12th graders, we're going to play one game for a billion takes off. You get a billion if you win. I get a billion if I win. Are you going to teach them like they're being taught today? No. Why not? Because they'll be too rigid. They won't be able to react to game situations. Then why are we doing it that way? That's my mission. Tradition, fear, lack of confidence. Coaches, whoever's doing the coaching, parents maybe, quite often it's parents. They don't have the background. They don't have the knowledge. They, they're, they see what other people are doing and they think, well, that must be right. And they're fearful of, of uh, thinking outside the box. Cattle herd. Yeah. Cattle herd. I, if I had a bunch of fourth graders, I'd get a bunch of balls and I'd get a gym and we would just do fundamentals forever. We would pass and catch and dribble and have fun and we'd have you know, rep ball wrestles for competition and we'd do all kinds of things. That's, uh, the, it's just so they had fun. I wanted them to have fun being in a gym with a ball and uh, I'd, be, I'd be very cognizant of not being too uh, uh, not putting pressure on them, you know, too too precise, and just and then as 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 they got better and better, I'd say, well, let's uh, let's say let's go two on two, and I we'd refine it. You know, how mm -hmm. to get open? Where do you want to catch the ball? How how are you going to catch the ball right there? You're going to pop out here. You're going to walk in there. You're going to you're going to step into them, you're going to pop out, you're going to show your hands, and you're going to catch the ball. What are you going to do when you catch the ball? you you got to have a pivot foot. and These are pivot. And I do drills leading up to the pivot foots, the pivot feet. So that's what I would do. I'd just have days where they just did pieces of the game. Spend a lot of time on shooting and um, maybe have lower baskets to teach the correct the, the correct uh, movement as as I see it the the left right foot you know I don't like hop shooting I like left right even uh, even uh, the best shooters Curry Steph Curry McLaughlin used to be like that they they were so good at getting those feet down boom boom left right and I teach that and um, so that's what I would do and then I uh, in twelfth grade I think we have a pretty good shot mm -hmm. I think we have a pretty good shot. And that's where I go back to the blueprint. What I'm trying to do is the old man, the gym, talk to people like you. But let's get the blueprint. Let's get a, a plan. If, if we wouldn't do that, and, and one of the things that I've tried to do, like at Midland what I tried to do, one of the things that I didn't understand was, okay, how do we have four games a week and two practices? No. It should be the opposite. Europe. Europe's the opposite. Yeah, it's the how, opposite. How are we going to get better having more practice? Well, because everybody game? wants to play a game. The, the, the parents want to cheer and say that my kid is best and my kid's starting. It's, kill, it's killing those kids. It's killing them. And they it, need to just love the game and be out there and have fun and fall down and get up. And 
I think the blueprint is obvious. Now it's whether or not people want to adopt that blueprint. The blueprint is less competition, more fundamentals. And so what I did, Dave, is I started this thing called family practice. Okay, so I invited the parents into the youth practice. Mm. This is what we're doing, you know. And we ran a four out, one in offense. Mm -hmm. And everybody had to play in, everybody had to play out. But then I would say, okay, this side of the court's out, we're going to play two on two over here which built into the four out one in offense, you know. You got a screen, you, you got a show cut, spacing and spacing and you know, well how far is fifteen feet, well how far is that? Well it's a good chess pass. Be a good chess pass away from somebody. And keep mm -hmm. it as simple as possible. But then to build their IQ, because I thought by sixth grade with the team that I coach when I got out of coaching at Northwood, I believe our sixth grade team knew a lot more about basketball than most varsity basketball teams. And I said, I want to begin with the end in mind. And to fight your point, you met my wife, she's highly competitive. There's a team in town called the Magic that would beat us by 25 points. And we'd catch the ball inbounds and they would trap us. Mm -hmm. And then so I taught them upside line, middle, reverse, cross court opposite, but they knew we couldn't throw a cross court opposite. <laughs> we couldn't sure. throw it there as far as we could. So they would just take the whole circle away. And they would just beat us, and my wife would come home, and why won't you press them back? Why aren't you? And I'm like, well, oh, wait a minute. I don't have an ego anymore. I, I just want to help them play high school basketball, and mm -hmm. I don't see how that's going to help them play mm -hmm. high school basketball. By seventh grade, though, we could throw a cross court out. You know, we could move without the ball. We, we did find things. And I'm like you, we really limited dribbles. Um, I read a long time ago that Kobe Bryant said the best thing to teach spacing and offense is no dribble. no dribble. But we used to play it at Wolverine all the time. We played no dribble, and then we'll say, okay, now your team, that trip down the court gets one dribble. You better use it wisely. <laughs> Get it out of trouble or attack the basket. Then the third session we'd say, okay, you get one dribble every time you touch it, but you don't have to touch it. Then the fourth game we just played regular rules then the kids are smart. Kids are a lot smarter than you think. Oh yeah, they so pick said, up on that. Where do we play better? Well, we could or couldn't dribble. Well, when we couldn't dribble, we played a lot better. <laughs> you know, and it was just, it, it just has to kind of... Here was a game I used to play every day at the end of practice, every day. Uh, side out, five on five, uh, ten passes or a layup. Mm -hmm. And you get one dribble. Ten passes or a layup, offense got one dribble, and the defensive team was two down. And the game lasted one minute or 45 seconds on the clock. And, and or explain it, because this is, I mean, we got coaches here and youth coaches. See, well, this was for a varsity, but I mean. No, but I think it's great. See, what I found is as I talk to coaches, they all have a favorite thing they think that made them better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now, there's a lot of people in the Twitter world that are, they get a lot of followers by showing them plays yeah, that people um, run. Yeah, I've seen those. But I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I want to create five better players. Yeah. That's my mission in my life now, yeah. not five better players. Well, so I, had, I had two things that I liked. Uh, one was not this, um, five on four. And it had two purposes. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I'd hand the ball to somebody, uh, one of the players, and there was five on four. It was for two purposes. I wanted those four people to not give up a basket. I wanted them to die, not to give up a basket. One person had the ball, three people had one foot in the paint. And if they pass the ball, a new person's on the ball, this person drops one foot in the paint. And if they did it properly, the four, you couldn't score them. Because they were hustling, they were scrapping, they were getting loose balls. Then on the offensive side, you got an advantage. It's five on four. Find a way to get a basketball play accomplished. Get an open shot or a power move at the basket. So that was a thing I did a lot, five on four. Um, but every day at the end of practice, I would have a, a one-minute game or a two-minute game. And I had a defensive team that was two down, three down. Everything was one on one. There was a side out of bounds around midcourt. So you have you had to have a side out play because the half court line was there. You could go over and back. You had to teach them how to use both sides of the court. And the rules for the offense were you're ahead. You want a layup or free throws. That's it. No open jump shots. No, no. And the layup better be a layup. 
not not a floater, not a I mean a power move at the basket. And and they had a they had a space. They had to keep moving and they got one dribble. Once the ball was in bounds, the other team usually doubled or, or fouled, you know, they were very I told them to be physical. Be very physical. And uh, we did it every day and it, sometimes uh, I just called timeout and said, okay, 10 passes or a layup. We're three ahead, four ahead, 10 passes or a layup. Mm -hmm. And if you don't score a layup after 10 passes, keep going. And, and what, it, what it did, the people that didn't have the ball would move to open areas to help the person with the ball because they were under duress. But they got one dribble, which allowed them to dribble through traps or dribble into to create new passing lanes. So that was a drill that was a favorite of ours, and I thought we were uh, very good late game because we practiced it every day and they had confidence in it. Mm -hmm. uh, another drill was four on four half court. And the only and you played to five baskets, but the only or five points. The only way you could score is if you got a stop on defense. The defense scored. If I'm on defense and we stop you, that's one point. We stay on defense. New team comes in on offense. They get punished for not scoring. Now, if we're on offense and we score, we don't get a point, but now we go to defense. And those drills teach toughness and endurance and defensive activity. And there is no play. There's just playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, are some, those were some of my favorite things. Uh, the side, the two-minute game at the end of practice, one-minute game. The five-on-four to teach four, that four players can stop five. And the five-on-four to teach scoring when you have an advantage. So... Those are some of my favorites. I like uh, odd number games. I like I like anything that builds at a young age an IQ and understanding. So we say IQ concepts. Okay, the defense rotates. Well, where would you pass it? Pass it to where they rotate. And I thought the more they understood the concepts, the more then their instincts could kick in. You know, they absolutely. Could, okay, well, and that was to me it was first things first. Other than. I said begin with the end of mind. First things first, let's make them smart basketball players that love the game. And then what I did at youth practice is we gave homework. And then the parents kind of took the homework. And then you might like this, might not, but we had a green light test. We gave them shooting tests to give them permission to take that shot in the game. Every parent wants their kid to shoot. So sure. What, what do they do? They took them to gyms and passed those green light tests. Spent time. And every one of those kids got a college scholarship. They could shoot. You know, we didn't. They put the time in. Well, they put the time in. They worked on your form like you're talking about. The parents got involved with it. And then all of a sudden now they, they could make shots. They like to make shots. Um, I think the two biggest problems in youth basketball that I see, bad shots. They take bad shots. They just take horrible shots. So we really harped on shot selection. And the second thing that I think they do, they over dribble. So we played a lot of no dribble. No dribble. And then we'd, if a kid made a shot that I thought was a bad shot, we'd say no basket, just no basket. And we really tried to harp on them. I think if you satisfy shot selection and not over dribbling, with the youth. You're cooking. You've done a long, you've, you've went a long. You know what I used to say about players that shot crazy shots, shots that were low percentage? I used to stop everything. I'd just look around I'd say, you know, I think there's about three players on the planet that can make that shot. <laughs> And I, you're not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they just, you know, like, why is he embarrass me? I had another girl that wouldn't use the backboard two feet from the basket. It's my center for starter for me for three years. She played against your daughter. She, finally, her senior year, she used the backboard around. But during the time where she wasn't using the backboard, I'd stop everything. She'd shoot right at the rim. It's hard, one foot, not use that back. Mm. I'd say, Paris, when I'm old, I mean old. No, I'm on a. I'm sitting on a porch. I'm in a rocking chair. I, I'm barely alive. I want you to come over to my house and explain to me why you thought not using the backboard was the appropriate thing. She she hated that. <laughs> she hated it because she was wrong, and she knew she was wrong. But she was she had a habit. So we had a lot of drills where where she had to use the backboard. Mm -hmm. Had to. 
Um, here's another thing. Now, again, this is my philosophy. Most people don't. Agree. When I was a young coach, I pressed everything. I pressed and trapped and turned the tempo up. And then I saw Dick, we played Dick Bennett's team four times. No pressing. You could not get the ball in the paint. You could not get, you couldn't dribble it in. If, if you passed it in, you were double teamed. You had to throw it out. If you dribbled in, you ran into a guy. So my last few years of coaching, like my girls team here, who Midland Dow beat here by four. We had a good game. That team allowed 26.2 points a game because we there was no paint action. There was perimeter shooting under duress, no tip-ins, some free throws. But I, I made a decision where you were going to score. You're going to score some points, but you're not going to score them in a high percentage manner. You're going to get them where I want you to get them. Because invariably, and I see great teams press, but invariably, the opponent gets to the basket. Mm -hmm. Free throws, fouls, you know. Uh, and here's another thing. Guarding the ball. And the pros are terrible at it, I think. You, you drive by me, you start to drive. They turn and put their body on them and hound them all the way in. Charlie, I learned this from Charlie. You're guarding the ball, it goes this way. You retreat. You keep this relationship you know, you retreat. You don't let them turn the corner. You remember that girl from Midland High that went to Indiana? Jesse Walter. We played them in the regional final at Cadillac. She was, I thought she was really good, tall. And she had a lot of penetrating moves. I told the girl, just don't, just do that. Retreat. Don't let her get by you. She... Well, they beat us by eight points. I mean, it was a good game, but she, she couldn't function because she couldn't get by you. And so that's my philosophy. I don't pr I didn't press anymore, but I, I wouldn't let you score. Mm -hmm. You're not going to score. We're going to sprint back. We're going to get in the paint, and uh, we're not going to drive to the basket. You're not going to throw it. If you throw it in, we're doubling. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that's higher than the youth ball we're talking about. But here, I think but that's part of it. See, one of our, we have in the book, we call it the 14 K's, but the first five I gave you, which are automatic, but one of them is second step cutoffs. Mm. You know, if you talk to most coaches now, the things that they, they don't like on defense is a straight line drive. So we work with our little kids. We always say, drive like a cucumber, don't drive like a banana. Mm -hmm. And we tell the defense, make them drive like a banana. <laughs> don't let them drive like a cucumber. Big point. And you, you know, you just go out there and, and you guard them. And say, my mission is to give the varsity coaches the best players possible. If I want to help the game, I want to improve the game inside of it. Um, well, anything else you want to wrap it up and say your last No, but it just, just to say that your terminology with younger people is outstanding because it's fun stuff. It's, it's you know, the, the, the loop, whatever you call the looping pass and the cucumber or banana. I mean, all that stuff, they, they're going to remember that because it's fun. That, that's brilliant on oh. your part. No, I think I've uh, spent enough time talking. No, you're doing great. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. I'm flattered you, you asked. And Please tell Okay, to recap the conversation that we just had with Dave Ginsburg, I think that you can see that he's a wealth of knowledge, but equally a wealth of passion. When we were doing the interview, Coach Ginsburg kept having more things he wanted to add. He wants to do more. He never wants to do less. He always wants to do more. He was so accommodating uh, to set everything up for the old man in the gym on our trip to Traverse City. He got us a, a location, um, topic. He was very interested in, in doing the best he could. And my thing is just be as honest as you can. And you can tell by the interview that that's all Gins is. He's just going to be as honest as he can. Um, he still has a great passion for the game. I'm telling people out here, viewers, try to find, it's hard to find a Ginsburg or a Gins, but find somebody in your area that has experience and has the same kind of passion. These people want to get to give back. I was very struck by how humble Coach Ginsburg was 
and how much he said, if I had it over, I would have done this. And if I had it over, I would have done that. And he's probably being too humble because he did so many great things by evidence in how many Hall of Fames he's in. But he, he's a constant learner. He never stopped learning and he never stops wanting to give. So if you can find somebody in your area that kind of relates to a person that's around that want to give back, they really do want to give back. Um, so anyway, I hope you really enjoyed the conversation with Dave Ginsburg, and he's enthusiastic. He wants to do it again. So find people that want to give back. Find people like Gins. Thanks again, Coach Ginsburg.